Well, good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Warden Blackwell, president of the Leadership Institute, and it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this, our April Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast. We live in interesting times, and I found today something which I, I will not comment at all. I'll just read you a segment of it, uh, how, how interesting it is. <clears throat> For, this is from the continuation of the story that was on the front page. It says, Capitol Police on Monday requested an arrest warrant for Mrs. McKinney over the incident. A spokesman for the U.S. Attorney's Office said yesterday the matter was, quote, still pending, close quote. No action is expected before the end of the week. Meanwhile, House Republicans yesterday pressed for a resolution to commend the Capitol Police for their professionalism. And Democratic leaders did not support Mrs. McKinney or her charge of racial profiling in the incident. Quote, I don't think any of it justifies hitting a police officer, said House Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi of California. If it did happen, I don't think it was justified. <clears throat> um, as uh, always, if you would like a copy of uh, the presentations uh, at this or any number of past Wake Up Club breakfast, you can purchase them right across from the elevator on your, on your way out today. Uh, the studios uh, here, our, our production unit here, the LI Studios, will mail you as many of those tapes as you'd like at $15 apiece. <clears throat> Thus far in 2006, <coughs> excuse me, the Leadership Institute has trained 2,000 360 students in 101 schools. Our youth leadership school to be held in Orem, Utah this Friday and Saturday uh, now has uh, a, uh, registered more than 150 students, which will make this by far the largest youth leadership school we have ever conducted and uh, when that school gets registered, one of those students will be the Leadership Institute's 50,000th student. <clears throat> um, this year we've already placed 25 job seekers through our free employment placement program. And you have before you on the goldenrod sheets uh, the current schedule of the uh, schools scheduled for this year. Uh, this uh, schedule changes rapidly because we are constantly adding new schools to our um, um, to our program. Um, I would urge you to consider attending or sending a friend to one of our programs and um, we're going to be hosting a lot of programs. <clears throat> we are running very considerably ahead of last year's uh, students trained per date uh, record and it seems quite certain that we're going to uh, beat last year's record of training 6,131 students. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Brian Bengers who will uh, offer an invocation and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Brian was born in Baltimore <clears throat> and after moving to the DC area shortly thereafter he graduated from uh, Grace uh, Brethren Christian School in Waldorf. After high school, Brian joined the Air Force as a communications technician. He served tours in England, Florida, and Iraq. After serving four years active duty, Brian joined the 231st Combat Communications Squadron for the DC Air National Guard at Andrews Air Force Base. Um, Brian is currently uh, our Employment Placement Service intern here at the Institute and works for Jim Cromwell. Brian hopes to become a journalist and then a press secretary on Capitol Hill. Brian? Uh, let's pray. Lord, we come before you right now to thank you for our great nation, for the freedom we have, including the freedom to worship you. We pray for uh, President, our Congress, and our courts that you would give them wisdom. 
Lord, we also pray for our troops serving in places like Iraq, that you would watch over them and their families. And Lord, we pray that you direct our thoughts, words, and works, and frame us in the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray, pray these things in his name. Amen. Please stand for the pledge. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Brian. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you John Davis for an update on the activities of our campus leadership program. Uh, John is, off, is an office manager here for the Campus Leadership Program, and he grew up and attended school in Missouri, where he graduated with a degree in philosophy in 2005. He has used his Leadership Institute training often in campaigns, um, and most recently uh, to help elect his mother, a fellow Leadership Institute graduate, to the Missouri State Legislature. John has, <clears throat> has been with the Leadership Institute since uh, December and, <clears throat> and spends his time in CLP running day-to-day -day operations and special projects. Uh, uh, I turn to John often because I find it is very easy to get quick and accurate answers from John Davis. Well, like Morton started out the breakfast this morning, we do live in interesting times. Uh, and for us in, in the campus leadership program, a lot of the reason those times are so interesting is because Morton has such a very exciting vision uh, for what he wants to do on college campuses. And uh, it's really an amazing thing to, to be part of, of you know, seeing what Morton wants and actually seeing that, that come into action. Um, we have over 700 groups and, and we've had a very successful spring program. And, and it's amazing, you know, I, I was uh, in UCon at UConn in Connecticut this weekend with Anthony Mantova. And, and it's amazing to see what even one of those groups can do on a college campus. Um, while we were there, uh, Ward Churchill came to speak. We, we decided to greet him. So w there were several CLP students with, with signs out front. Um, which, which welcomed him nicely, at least politely. Um, we also greeted as, as people walked in, they were, they were there to hand out articles uh, called The Seven Faces of Ward Churchill. And they just couldn't tell which one was the real one. Um, as well, Ward Churchill being, being the man who felt that people in, uh, in the two towers on 9-11 deserved uh, pretty much what they got. Uh, exactly when he got to that point of his speech, our CLP students decided to get up and, and join a number of students in walking out of the auditorium, something that is uh, being covered in the school paper. Uh, beyond that, they are having student government elections, and the same CLP students are working and, and we believe are we're pretty optimistic, are going to be successful in overthrowing their school government, uh, their student government, and, and gaining more control over the funding mechanisms, which right now send most money toward the liberal groups on campus. In addition to that, um, they are on the same ballot. They've been successful at getting an initiative to get their uh, PERG off campus. The PERG is, is a public interest research group, which Ralph Nader began in the um, 1970s. And he came up with a great way to fund it. He, he managed to get these, these groups on campuses all across the country. And, and through student fees, many of which are funneled back to the National PERG, um, he manages somewhere between 10 and 20 million dollars in funding a year. And so when, when we see, you know, the way, the way Morton has his plans and, and our CLP groups are out there and, and following up on this, and it's, it's just an amazing thing to be a part of. Even on top of this, you know, just last week, the, the Yukon, there was an anti-capitalism protest that targeted Coca-Cola Company which uh, the same CLP students, or a great group, um, were out there offering Coke to, to the protesters and, and to the people going by. 
So we, um, you know, besides, and this is, this is just at one college, you know, we have, we have events going on all across the country in all of our groups. I was one of our brand new groups at Clemson I was just talking to yesterday, and they had their first conservative coming out day where they, they acknowledged that even on college campuses it can be scary, you know, but, but you're not alone. There, there are, it's okay to come out and admit you're a conservative and you're not the only one. Um, we, we have uh, a number of groups that have done, um, that are having tax pro, that are having tax reform protests coming up. We have a number on the third anniversary of the Iraq war. We had a great number of support the troops rallies. Uh, so it's, it's really exciting to see what's happening and, and to see these things changing and to be a part of that. Um, and that's, that's really what's going on with, with the, the campus leadership program right now. Thank you. Thank you, John. An excellent report. I would only add that we are now in the business of um, recruiting the 60 full-time field staff we will send out in September to travel to all the college campuses. Um, we sent 27 last year and, uh, in September, and we'll send 60 uh, this year. <clears throat> Now I uh, present to you Rachel Dendu. Um, she will introduce our excellent speaker with whom I spent uh, last weekend in Philadelphia. Uh, Rachel grew up in the Midwest and attended Bethel College at uh, Mishawaka, got it right, uh, Indiana. Uh, after working as a tennis professional for two years, she returned to graduate school at Florida State and earned her master's in international affairs in 2004. She began working at the Leadership Institute last month as a membership assistant. Rachel? Well, Dr. William Dennis stays quite busy these days as a senior fellow of the Atlas Research Foundation, a program officer with the Law and Economic Center at George Mason Law School, and independent philanthropy consultant. Originally from Indiana, Dr. Dennis worked in various capacities for both the Liberty Fund and its sister organization, both of which are dedicated to encouraging the study of ideals, such as a society of free and responsible individuals. With a PhD in history from Yale University, Dr. Dennis also spent several years as a professor of American history at Denison University. Quite notably, from 1981 to 1983, he served as a special assistant to the Assistant Secretary for Policy, Budget, and Administration for the U.S. Department of the Interior. A gentleman and a scholar, we are most privileged to have Dr. Dennis here with us today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. William Dennis. conservative leaders who are actually capable of, of, of leadership, and uh, we all appreciate it. Uh, it's also fun to touch bases this morning. Uh, David Frankie, another one, uh, joins the long list of former Liberty Fund employees. David, were you the first director of publications? Yes. And uh, I was a director of publications in there somewhere, too. So it's a great organization, and uh, some other day we can talk about it. Um, give you a little bit more autobiography here as I get started. There in the green folder, actually, all the details there are correct, which is somewhat unusual, actually. <laughs> right, right when you see your autobiography, your biography set out before you like that. But hidden in there is this sort of strange interlude in my life as a, a very low-ranking official of the Department of Interior. And um, I came about that in a sort of strange way. While I was still teaching at Denison, 
I was invited by John Bodden and Rick Stroop, then running something called the Center for the Study of Political Economy and Natural Resources at Montana State University, to a conference in 1980 on the philosophical and uh, historical origins of the sagebrush rebellion. One of the participants of this small Liberty Fund conference up in the mountains in Montana was James G. Watt. And six months later, he was uh, Secretary of Interior. And uh, the story is longer than this, and so we'll go into it. But it eventually, he asked me to come down to the Department of Interior. Here I was, a his history professor with interest in colonial America and Puritanism, <laughs> the founding and things like that, uh, in, in a very new world. But it wasn't altogether a new world because I'd been spending a lot of time out in the mountains hiking and climbing and uh, camping out. In those days, I was spending about 60 days a year in a sleeping bag in the ground someplace instead of writing the great work of uh, American history that uh, perhaps I should have been doing. But I don't, I don't think so, and I don't regret it. But because of those two years in interior, I got to know a, a lot about sort of practical things in American natural resource policy, and I wrote a few articles and did some other things. And I've come back to that in the last uh, couple years. I try to put together a book of my thoughts about uh, liberty and the environment. And uh, I have the current version of it here, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the book and then read you a couple paragraphs or a little bit more, pending on time, have it, and uh, stop so we can talk. The, the, the book's tentatively titled, Thinking Environmentally, Liberty in the Place of Man and Nature. It's not a book about policy. It's kind of a philosophic musing, partly drawing upon my days in the mountains, and partly thinking about what it means to be a human being. And uh, a, a free man. So let me, let me give you a couple of the big points I try to get across here and then see if I can get you interested enough in it to, to talk about it. Here's the first point I want to make. I think all of us, practically without exception, and particularly conservatives, keep talking about the environment. And this is a real mistake. There isn't the environment out there. And it leads to very bad and sloppy thinking about environmental matters. We all know, when we think about it just for a moment, that there are lots of environments. And different animals are suited for different sorts of environments. And different plants fit into different places in environments. And that the natural world is a world in continual flux, with new plants moving in and their associated animals and others moving out. And uh, <clears throat> those environments run from the absolute dark, hot, uh, molten vents in the bottom of the ocean to uh, high altitude glaciers. Everywhere on this planet, life has been able to find a foothold. Now, when we think about it that way, we can begin to say, well, maybe what we need to think about is human environments. What environments should have humans lived in? And again, we find that humans are very adaptable to adaptable different physical environments, that they've been able to make a living of one sort or another practically every place on the planet except Antarctica. Now even we don't actually live there, but we stay there. So what have they done with these environments? And once we start thinking about that, just a little bit of reading and work real makes us realize that we've been transforming the environments, that we've, the physical environments that we've lived in, to suit ourselves. Uh, we burn the underbrush. We graze cattle. We build buildings. And we change the world we live in. And we change it uh, to, sit, to suit our human needs. Other animals do this too, but not in a direct and planned way as, as human beings have done as long as we know about it. And <clears throat> the thing most importantly we've done is we've created civilizations, societies. We've moved, removed ourselves from nature and built cities. And we, much as I like being in the mountains, we belong in these settled areas. And <clears throat> 
Uh, when we start thinking about that, it seems to me the next step we can easily move to is, is something about the history of the development of human civilization. And I think, work this out at some length in the uh, manuscript, I think when we take a look at that, we realize that what we are especially suited for is what I call the environment for liberty. Uh, and this environment has been hard won over the ages. It isn't obvious. It hasn't been popular. It's emerged only slowly out of an agonizing history of several millennia. But once it comes into operation, and we can take a look at it and study it and see what its components are, we realize that this is a very special kind of environment because it allows people with different customs, different tastes, different perspectives, different ideas, different backgrounds, cultures, ethnicities, religions, so on and so forth, to live together in relative peace and harmony and escape the horrible bind that human humans have lived in through most of their history, where they lived in some society organized and run by a few for their benefit at the expense of many. So we know what the components of this environment for liberty are, and none of you would have any trouble listing them. Listing them. But I'll just give you my cat, my list as, as I go as I go on here. Limited government with divided political power. Rule of law. Government taking its power directly or indirectly from the great body of the people large, as Madison says in his definition of Republican in Federalist 39. Well-defined, protected, and transferable property rights, and a wide array of what I call personal practical liberties. The ability to kind of get on with your life and do what you want to with it, for the most part, as um, you see fit. <clears throat> say something particularly about just one aspect of, of this environment for women. Maybe we can come back and talk about it. And that's the secure transferable property rights. It has been the American lesson that from the very start, at the heart of our worldview and our political order is the idea of private property. As you all know, out coming out of medieval Europe, the definition of a free man was somebody who owned sufficient property to be a part of the political order, to take part in the uh, uh, political organization of his day. And in England in particular, which was more uh, generous in their understanding of the connection of property right and property rights and liberty, that basically was the 40 shilling freehold. The amount of land it took, and if you could rent it out for a year, on a yearly basis, it would rent for 40 shillings, maybe 50 acres of land. And the thought was that if you had that much land, it did a whole lot of things that were important. Because to take, hold on to that land, you had to be a responsible person. It was hard work to, to manage that land and pass it on to your heirs. Um, it took diligence and integrity. It also meant that you had a stake in the society of all over that thesis. Uh, that you were part naturally of the, of the political order. And so it would be all right and not a danger to let you have some direct or at least indirect participation in the body politic. Now, when you get take the 40 shilling freehold and you come to America, all of a sudden you find that there are lots of possibilities for 40 shilling freeholds. That in England, where the land mostly been taken up, and where the 40 shilling freehold is as, as liberal political order as it was, had gained, had become something of a static society. In America, it was this unbelievably free for all, <laughs> gaining land, buying land, selling land, moving over and over again. Uh, and the Americans quickly learned how to play this game at, uh, at, uh, with great ability and, and enthusiasm. I spent a lot of time talking about all this in my manuscript. Uh, something that the, that the British never understood. Uh, and it's at the heart of the American Revolution. 
about taxation without representation. It wasn't taxation without representation. It was taxation, period. Oh, Americans paid almost no taxes. And uh, they didn't have to ask anybody to pick up and move. And we always hear about Jefferson got rid of primogenitor and entail and ended the medieval uh, organization of, of, of real estate. But that's not really true. He, he did get rid of primogenitor entail officially, but it had already been gotten rid of them. <laughs> Nobody followed it. You could always, through uh, use of wills, devise your land to whomever you wanted, with some rights to widows and, that, and, and, and children and that sort of thing. Yeah, but, but even there, mostly, if you had a will, you could get rid of that out, out doing that. And Americans just did this. And on the brink of the American Revolution, as you'll remember from history books, they're about to spill over the Appalachian uh, mountain crests and move out into the Middle West. And, and as we know, the rest of it is, is history. But what we've maybe forgotten now, after we've settled this continent, Frederick Jackson's Turner's, Turner's Frontier gets closed and all the rest is. So we're still this great land, this, this property owning people. And um, if you look at us in comparison to Europe today, which is also you know, nominally a free society, there's nothing like it over there. We, we still buy and sell real estate. And we, and we learn how to do other things. We have condominiums and high rises and uh, um, beach homes and and all sorts of different ways to own and devise uh, not only real physical property, but hypothetical property, imaginary property, <coughs> like airwaves and things of this sort. And so liberty and property in, the, in America in particular are, are twin things. It was free land at the beginning, and the notion of freedom and land tied together, and now it's free property. And I already see the political order trying to do something about this and messing up that linkage. We know that um, uh, liberty is being assaulted and power, which in the colonial America, everybody knew liberty and power were antagonistic forces. Power is asserting itself in improper ways. <clears throat> Let me, um, at this point, just for the fun of it, read you a couple pages of this material, partly going over what I've just done. And trying to think here how much time I have left. Maybe that's a mistake. <clears throat> I'll, 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 I'll try something different. So my first point, my first big point is stop talking about the environment. Let's talk about the special environment for liberty that humans particularly uh, benefit from. Now, <clears throat> that's my second point, the environment for liberty. Third point I want to say is, is that though we've separated ourselves from nature, we still like the natural world out there. And when we talk about the environment, most people kind of mean that kind of general unfocused life of uh, the outdoors, and clean air, and sparkling streams, and so on and so forth. And that's all for good, but the nice thing about the environment for liberty is, 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 is twofold. The first one, this, this, this needs a lot more development than I have time to, to make much of this morning. The first is that nice, generalized love of the outdoors is not a unitary thing. Uh, I saw in the New York Times the other day an article about the possibility that the Irieville woodpecker is still alive in the swamps of Arkansas. And one of the uh, people in the neighborhood was quoted in the New York Times as saying, what is it about this Irieville woodpecker anyway? Is it good to eat? <laughs> now, that used to be kind of a joke I'd make talking about the environment of people, to try to show you that people didn't have the same views of things. I, because my old uh, boss at Liberty Fund used to say the same thing about spotted owl, which you know got in the way of lumbering in the West Coast. And he did it as a joke. But here was a serious woman actually saying, 
What is it about the ivory bill woodpecker? Is it good to eat? Well, if you take that kind of funny line and think about, uh, it, uh, about that problem elsewhere, you find it's everywhere. And one of my favorite things is to talk about wilderness because I spent a lot of time on my past hiking and climbing, mostly in Wyoming and Montana. And you know, wilderness isn't anything either. Uh, any one thing. It's a statutory creation, 1964 Wilderness Act. But it's also a psychological concept in, hum in humans, humans' minds. And when you look at it as a psychological concept, different people mean different things by wilderness. Um, once coming out of the mountains, uh, at dusk, after an all day climbing in the Tetons, friends and I bumped into two women men. Women were in kind of high heels, and all three of them were carrying plastic martini glasses in their hands. And somehow they'd gotten about a half mile out to the Grand Teton National Park down a very rough trail, and it was dark. Now, and here we come clinking out of the dusk. That was a pretty good wilderness experience for them. <laughs> I, I suppose they made it back to Jenny Lake Lodge where they had been having dinner before the night was over. Uh, I was surprised to see them there, and I'm sure they were surprised to see us and probably glad it wasn't a bear. Or uh, maybe they were disappointed. But anyway, you know, once you start thinking about wilderness and that, what is it? What do you do with it? Put in bridges, put in trails, a lot of people have maps. A few years ago in the Tetons, some a party got lost on well, an off route, the Grand Teton, and pretty bad uh, situation for their level of skills and knowledge of the mountains. And they called Jenny Lake Ranger Station, their cell phone, and the great uh, climbing ranger, Rennie Jackson, there said, oh yeah, I know exactly where you are. If you move two feet to the left and reach way up high, you'll find a handhold you missed, and then you'll be able to get to the top. Now, is that a wilderness? <laughs> uh, maybe we shouldn't have cell phones, the wilderness. Maybe we shouldn't have trail signs. Maybe we should have to leave our seven and a half minute USGS quadrangles behind if we want to go out in the wilderness and be like Lewis and Clark were. But you can see the problems. Most of the things we call resources, most of the things we talk about when we are interested in the outdoors are not real things any more than the environment is. They are human things. They're stuff that we talk about and define for ourselves and humans define things in different ways. Uh, yeah, one obvious example I often use talking about this, and you can all see it. Uh, oil's been around the Middle East forever. It's mentioned in the Bible. It was something that was in the way. It made seeps in the land, ruined crops and stuff like that when it bubbled up where it wasn't supposed to be. It took the human genius of Western technology and imagination to see what you could do with all that oil that was out there and had been there for the ages. And there will be new things out there if we can't imagine that somebody will think of. It will create new kinds of property if they're allowed to do it, free society, that will bring us other wonderful blessings. The most obvious one, recent one, is the internet. When I left Denison in 1985, most of my colleagues are a little more advanced than these ideas than I was had big computers in their desk and tied into a uni university mainframe. Internet is just in its infancy. When I came back and taught a couple of courses for Roger Ream a year ago, I could bring up in the screen in the classroom in Georgetown everything in the universe that was on the internet and talk about it with my students. Unbelievable. In maybe 10 years or less. Um, <clears throat> now, the next point I would like to make, and, and this one is another big point, so we won't have a chance to, to uh, really do much about it. I'll just mention it because it's something in everybody's mind. Everybody's talking now about sustainability. Uh, and are we going to be able to sustain the kind of world that we've created for ourselves over the last 2,000 years? We're going to be able to bring the benefits of liberty, the material benefits of liberty, to all portions of the earth. Well, we don't know whether we can or not, because people make lots of mistakes along the lines, and maybe we won't adapt to environmental liberty, and maybe 
people who want to get rich won't create the institutions that allow them to get rich. But I would suggest to you, when it comes to sustainability, that capitalism is, is the economy of sustainability. It always has been. It's what it's about. Capitalists use that great human intellect, which I mentioned a moment before, creating resources out of nothing, to produce with the same amount of raw stuff incredibly new and rich developments that uh, no one had, had uh, uh, thought of before. So capitalism is the institution that permits and encourages innovations, uh, makes the best creative use of human talents and initiative, because, and, and doesn't try to plan ahead what those are, and say, well, you know, go down this road but not that road, but it sets everybody free, and we don't know who's out there with a great new idea. Um, through competition, it encourages the efficient use of these resources once, it, once, this, once they're created. It encourages the conservation of energy, because you can save money doing that way. And it encourages people who own productive enterprises to think about ways to use waste flows, effluents. Because if you can figure out how to use them instead of throw them away, you can make money out of that also. It is the institution that thrives in recycling. I got a brochure stuck in my door the other day saying, if you're about to sell your house and you think it's going to be a teardown, come to us. We will recycle the old prop building materials as part of the teardown operation and uh, reuse them. Isn't that neat? A whole company devoted to doing just this and pointed out some addresses in my neighborhood where I could go see where, the, where they'd, they'd worked recently. And finally, sort of a reiteration of an old point. Um, it creates, expands the resource space by, the create, by creating new things out of where there was nothing at all. Now, I've got one minute left, according to my, is that right? Let me read you opening an opening paragraph of my concluding chapter. They bring in a little pol political flavor. It's a group that likes politics. And there's not much of that in this manuscript. At the conclusion of President Ronald Reagan's message to Congress that accompanied the 15th Annual Report of the Council of Environmental Quality, 1984, we find these words. This is the President's message. Conservation means the efficient use of natural resources. Stewardship entails a love of the land and determination to pass on to future generations a high quality environment sustainable for human living. A strong nation is one that is loved by its people, and as Edmund Burke put it, for a country to be loved, it ought to be lovely. The ideas of conservation and stewardship suggest also that economic productivity is not a proper end in itself. It is only a means to the end of improved lives for all Americans. Riches alone do not guarantee the maintenance of a social order in which people can take pride. But conservation and stewardship should never come to mean opposition to change, to the fear that new developments will more likely bring personal decline than social advance. The discomforts of change will be more than compensated by the benefits of a dynamic economy in securing opportunity for new generations and in rewarding individual enterprise and initiative. A society of rising accomplishment and enhanced expectations provide a better life for its people, a cleaner environment, and improved health and nutrition, superior educational, cultural, and recreational opportunities. Inspired by promise, sustained by hope, past generations of Americans built a free and prosperous nation based upon the principles of individual initiative and personal responsibility, and upon private institutions of many types. They worked to turn our abundant natural resources to productive use. And they learned to love their new land and its grand vistas, its mountains and forests, its fertile fields, and its bustling cities. Environment and natural resource policy can be used to help further these ideals so that liberty, <coughs> prosperity, and a beautiful and healthful natural environment will continue to bless the lives of the American people. Then surely our good times will not have passed. Indeed, our best days will be yet to come. Now, maybe you won't be surprised to know, after you've heard me before, that at that time I was helping counsel environmental policy write some things for its annual report, and these words that were put into President Reagan's mouth were most of mine. <laughs> but I wrote this 
was writing this, working this chapter in 19, in 2004 when President Reagan died. Has given us. So I'll stop now. Let's see if there's any questions or comments. Um, uh, sir? Uh, there was a fellow who was discussed on Russia the other night, the other morning, the other day, I mean, um, who takes the view that uh, popu the human population of the earth is contaminating it, and that uh, in order to stop that process, we need to uh, eliminate about 95% right, of the world's population. Him. Uh, but it illustrates what you said. Uh, who are you trying to optimize for? Yeah. And uh, obviously, in, in his case, he's not trying to optimize for us. Well, but this guy's clearly crazy. I, mean, I guess he hasn't volunteered himself as one of the 90% to die. But, but I, I, I've heard other people say more moderate versions of that thing. And indeed, uh, one of the uh, Frequent commentators on National Review Online uh, a few months ago said, we all know that America would be a better place than 160 million people. We do. We all know that. <laughs> uh, in an article I, in, in, in the great uh, conservative magazine, Modern Age, which I contributed to, I think very well, uh, somebody wrote some time ago that everybody knew that uh, 2 million visitors to Rocky Mountain National Park was more than it should have. We know that. Uh, this is, this I think is, this is too easy kind of thinking and too many people slip into it. Yeah, I would rather have nobody. <laughs> My favorite quadrangle, quad, quadrangle that I ever hiked in is called Gannett Peak, Wind River Mountains. It says down the corner, there are no roads or trails in this area. But that's not the way most people feel about the world. And, 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 would we, we would not, there was no way we would build the Blue Ridge Parkway today, or Trail Ridge Road, or go into the Sun Highway, uh, which are these magnificent uh, ways for, to allow most American people to get into the heart of wild country, on their, in their cars, and even in their RVs. Do I like it? Not a whole lot. Do I think it's good for America? Absolutely. Uh, there's a hand way at the back. Uh, yes, there you go. Excuse me. With uh, a positive experience at uh, Bruno Bay, why are the environmentalists uh, so uh, adamantly opposed to drilling at Anwar? I, I think it really is a symbolic thing for them. Um, my friends at um, at the Political and Economy Research Center, pretty political. What do they call it now? Property and Environment Research Center in Bozeman and John Bodden Group Foundation for Resource Economic Environment, Economics and Environment have shown a long time ago that when where the environmental groups own land, they find ways to get the oil and gas out of the land they own, and they don't hurt the the their the environment as they see it. They put in particular environmental protections. And of course, the government's promised to do that in uh, in 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 the Anwar areas also can be done. It's not that hard to do. So it's really a religious matter. Those sorts of people are, are another version of the man you brought, that somehow it's the very presence of not so much maybe in their case humanity, but the artifacts, the things we make that we bring into the wild area that spoils its spiritual value. And a lot of the stuff that would get hang, hung up on in, in terms of political controversies when it comes to outdoor stuff or really conflicts of what Thomas Sowell calls conflicts of vision or what uh, my friend and colleague, former colleague uh, Robert Nelson at the University of Maryland calls, calls conflicts of religions, of different faiths. And my, my view is, is that one thing we know more than anything else in America is that you don't want to politicize conflicts of religion. So, and I, this is, this is a whole, this is what most of this book is about, actually. So I say, let's try to put more of the great outdoors in the hands of private individuals, and they'll figure out ways to work out the conflicts. But if you have the government run everything, then you really have a, a win-lose situation, where one party, at least for a while, gets its way, 
and the other face doesn't. And that leads to lots of uh, uh, unpleasant situations and circumstances. So I think that speaks to, to your point, doesn't it? So I say, give Anwar the Sierra Club, and let's get the oil out of it. <laughs> Any, anybody else like to get involved with a, a conflict or a, I mean a comment or a question? Morton? I, I want to uh, follow up on something you said at the outset of, of your remarks. Um, the, uh, you went through the, the attributes of a free society and, uh, in, including in them uh, um, property rights to, to own and to transfer, legal system, etc. Um, the uh, I think you were the only one at the Philadelphia Society meeting uh, last weekend who stressed these things, and you did it repeatedly. And the the, the theme of the meeting for those who who uh, don't know it, and that's everybody in the room except. <laughs> the two of us. Um, the theme of the meeting was uh, you know, where in the world are we going and what's the future of the United States and there was an awful lot of discussion about the war in, in Iraq, etc. But um, almost everybody was talking about just the establishment of democracy as if uh, the establishment of democracy would would be sufficient for a free and stable and, and prosperous operation. And maybe some people were maybe using the word democracy as a shorthand for the sorts of thing you were talking about. Um, but uh, it, it's greatly concerned me when they, when we started off uh, in Iraq, I was not, <clears throat> I, I, I talked to people in the, in the government who might have some influence on it. I said, you know, are we going to have um, the private property rights and rule of law and swift justice, uh, swift and fair justice, et cetera? Would you would you talk a bit about that because you you, you're, you were the only one who who said that uh, repeatedly this past weekend? I'm a guy until I won it, but I think you're right. I try never to use the word democracy. Uh, I did say government direct taking its power, its legitimacy, directly or indirectly from the great body of the people at large, and that's something different. And uh, so I wish the president would talk about liberty. And uh, there are lots of ways you could have, there are lots of political means you could, you could have a, a pretty, pretty free society. I do think that The world we live in is a world in which people everywhere, in ways they never did before, see the possibilities of being, of being a participant in the political order. So you can't probably have a constitutional monarchy of the 18th century British sort and get away with it any longer, even though that was a great free uh, uh, government and one of the best probably the best government the world had ever seen before 1776. But, you know, this, this is a silly old story, but maybe you all have had a version of it. Liberty Fund sent me to Guatemala once. I had never been into an underdeveloped country in my life before. We had a conference up in the mountains. Ancient, the old uh, uh, colonial capital of Antigua, beautiful city, surrounded by poverty of rural Guatemala. And there in my hotel room, they had CNN in English. I didn't have CNN at my, my TV at home. <laughs> it was a big treat. And I said, oh my gosh, you know, this is a different kind of world. And all over the world, they got CNN in English. And they're looking at it. Morton, I'm not sure that was quite directly to your point. I do think do you think we're making a mistake in the kind of language we use when we talk about the world we would like to see? But I do think it has to be a world in which uh, the opportunities that people rightly see as now possible, the personal opportunities that people all over the world rightly see now as possible for them, 
have a chance to move forward. And I doubt if that can happen unless it's a government that takes some popular aspect to it. But that doesn't guarantee that it will happen. As we can see already in, in uh, Iraq, there are some problems maybe looming there that will be very difficult to deal with. Have time for one more question and then and stop in? Okay, yeah. You touched on a, a point uh, I'd like to raise it at, at, your, at the end of your last question. And that is about the uh, putting hands in the, in the private sector. Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, putting lands Land. in the private sector. And uh, I wonder if you could touch on that. Uh, seems to me uh, we should have a more concerted effort to try to do that. I agree. Because the benefits would be... Uh, you know, the value, and you add up the value of the lands, the timber, the mineral rights, uh, it should be worth several trillion dollars. We could pay off a substantial report of the portion of the uh, federal debt if we did that. Uh, it would put the lands in the private sector, which would be a better steward, and it would subject the land to state and local taxation. But it's the sort of thing that uh, seems to be taboo right now, right. or there's not any vision for doing it. And I was wondering what you think... Uh, Going forward, the outlook yeah. on that would be. Well, well, the great um, now deceased um, uh, sort of um, political philosopher uh, of the National Forest Lands, Marion Clausen, actually did a study once where he can calculated what the uh, foregone value of keeping the forest hand, the forest national forest lands in the uh, hands of the government, at least the proportions you were talking to. And he had real figures based upon his knowledge of stuff. Now look, here, here, here's my general view of this. I'm going to be real fast and we need to get out of here. Uh, there, there probably should be some national treasures, like just like the national the Washington Monument or something in the hands of the national government. So, but we don't know what they are. I mean, we, we, we've got all sorts of stuff in the federal state. 40% of the country, maybe more. Count military bases and Indian reservations and uh, things of this sort owned by the national government. That's free free land of ours. So I said to Interior, I said, why don't we get every time that some preservationist group wants to set aside Track A, tell them that they had to propose a Track B that was twice as large as Track A in acreage that would be put up for sale. Of course, that didn't get anywhere. So I've been disappointed that the current administration's part of Interior hasn't been more forceful in trying to, to sell off some of the lands. You could take most of the national forests, for instance. I spent lots of time in the national forests. I love the national forests. But on the edges, you could sell off five-acre lots for a million dollars apiece and let people put in their summer homes and put in protections for the wildlife and stuff. And it, it not only would, wouldn't hurt the forest, it would help them because it would create a constituency nearby that wanted to uh, see that the Outdoor values were enhanced rather than resist every uh, 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 eroded. That's quick. I'm sorry, but you know, does that speak? That speaks a little bit to you. I guess I'm saying like you, the pro current prospects don't look good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very interesting remarks. Certainly that uh, is a, a viewpoint and a, a, an analysis that we don't uh, see very often in the Washington Post or the New York Times. Uh, as a, a token of appreciation, and I know you will appreciate this, uh, um, I present to you one of our Leadership Institute, Adam Smith Pie. Thank you very much. Ten more seconds. How many of you have been to um, Sugarloaf Mountain out in Maryland? A private mountain yep. created by a man who thought about it as long ago as 1912. We can do these things. You sit down. <laughs> I invite you all to join us on Wednesday, May 3rd. Uh, the next month's Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast speaker will be uh, the junior senator from Oklahoma, Dr. Tom Coburn. Uh, who is certainly a rising star uh, in the Senate and certainly uh, looked to with great uh, admiration by the conservative movement. And those of you who uh, would like a tour this morning of the uh, Leadership Institute, top to bottom, uh, 
here is your guide, Christy Mead. We'll do it. You can join her after the, uh, we adjourn, which is imminent. And uh, she'll be happy to run you through the office or walk you through the office as you <laughs> uh, Thank you all very much.